Today, uh, during this chapel, we will be uh, taking time to reflect on the life and work and ministry of uh, a great um, man in the history of the entire universe, a man from this very own country, Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., yes. Um, our hope is that this chapel, we will hear um, just the ways in which uh, the life of Martin Luther King makes meaning for us today. This is a man whose life, um, whose work, whose prayers, whose sweat has transformed the very course of history for many people, not only here in the United States, but world over. Today we will hear from a number of students, um, both on the grad and the undergrad side, who will give some reflections on different aspects of Martin Luther King's life and work. And we hope that we'll be able to very well think about what this means for us today. After chapel, we have set up um, a walkthrough where you'll be able to just read about some of the, uh, the work of Martin Luther King, the things that we've talked about here, to reflect upon them, to engage with his work. And on Monday, we will have uh, the screening of the film Selma in Trinity Hall at 2 o'clock, and we'll have conversation around that. So before we get into this, I just ask you to join me in prayer, and then we will hear from uh, Stephen Lee, from uh, S uh, Christy Escobar, Christiana Underwood, Alexandra Santos and Kotori Seals. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time uh, as a community to sit in this room and just reflect on uh, a man who took time to pour his life, uh, to bring change, to be a light in this world. We pray that we too will learn to use what you have entrusted us with for your glory and that we will never be afraid to be the things that you've called us to be. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So when I was preparing this message, I had a few concerns in my head. Uh, what I mean by this is I was a Korean dude talking about the significance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and somehow tied forgiveness. So I began to ask a question. What would Dr. King tell me if I ask him, hey, Dr. King, do you think I have a right to talk about you as an Asian? Uh, do you think I have a place in this conversation that seems like mainly between the white and black Americans? Then I began to read his works and talk with people who knew about his character. Then I realized that the answer will be yes. The answer would have been yes because what Dr. King dreamed about and what he fought for was not just the rights and the opportunities for the African Americans, but it was also for the reconciliation. So I believe that, in fact, he will be very happy and glad to see me here, an Asian man, giving attributes to him and to the African-American community because his dream was not only an African-American dream, but it was the kingdom dream. So you see, so what Dr. King and the civil rights activists uh, brought out to the surface was not just the racism and the oppression uh, between the white and black but what they brought out was the greater reality of hatred that hinders us from the reconciliation as children of God. And in this reality, although the love for others was discriminatory and separated based on the colors of our skin, the hatred for others was not discriminatory and was equal. It wasn't simply that the people of color weren't allowed to own property, vote, and be at certain places, but the nation as a whole, with its culture, with its law and structures, practiced hatred in the form of racism. So I believe that Dr. King was not only dealing with the situation where you get certain laws passed and make political changes, but he was also dealing with something bigger, which was the sin of hatred. And I believe that his goal was not just the freedom from oppression and opportunities for the people of color, yet I believe that his goal was also a heavenly goal where, where people are reconciled both in structure and in the spirit. And he knew that the problem was bigger than just the racial conflicts, but the problem was the fallen human conflicts resulted from the darkness and the sin. And he also knew that you don't fight darkness with darkness. You don't fight sin with sin, but you fight darkness with light, and you fight sin with the gospel. And that is why I believe that he preached and taught forgiveness. 
he did not just teach forgiveness to arouse people to peacefully march. He did not just teach forgiveness so the people who hate them feel pity for them. He did not just teach forgiveness for the advancement of the civil rights movement. But I, but I believe that he taught forgiveness because he knew the battle wasn't merely a physical one, but it was also a spiritual one. I believe that he taught forgiveness because there was a need for the reconciliation in structure and in the spirit. I believe that he taught forgiveness because that was what the gospel compelled us to do. He fought for the cause of the people of color, but he also fought for the cause of all Christians because injustice anywhere is threat to justice everywhere. So today, as we celebrate and remember the life of Dr. King and how God used him, for his purpose, I want to leave us with two things. One, for those of us who feel the need for justice without the goal of the gospel center reconciliation, let us remember that the pursuit of justice without the gospel and forgiveness is always under the danger of another form of hatred. And secondly, for those of us who care a lot about the gospel without the desire for racial reconciliation and justice, let us remember that even when you're studying God's word and his love in the most diligent and faithful way, you are always under the danger of perpetuating and practicing the existing form of hatred. So as we look back to see Dr. King's dream and look forward to dream about our mission, may we relentlessly and fiercely pursue the justice and the reconciliation with the gospel gentleness and forgiveness. Thank you. Love is not something that one can quantify with syllables. In searching for a way to talk about something as unfathomable as unconditional love, I sought out Mama D's help in the dining hall. She told me, love is not something you get from yourself. It comes from Christ. She said, we love because he already filled us up. We're just giving what we've been given. We don't have to know someone to love them because we've already received everything we need. There's a quote from a study Bible that struck me when I was studying this. To the expert in the law, um, in the Good Samaritan story, the wounded man was a subject to discuss. To the robbers, the wounded man was someone to use and exploit. To the religious men, the wounded man was a problem to be avoided. To the innkeeper, the wounded man was a customer to serve for a fee. But to the Samaritan, the wounded man was a human being worth being cared for and loved. To Jesus, all of them and all of us were and are worth dying for. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. expresses the importance of love in place of hate during the fight for reconciliation. If we are going to heal, we must look past ourselves and to the people around us instead, no matter where they come from or what life they lead. This is a love that goes beyond fear. It tears down boundaries and creates bridges for Christ to work through us and in us despite all of our trying to stop it or fear of doing something. There are two sets of verses that explain this love better than I could hope to do. One, you all know, 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Such a simple word. It's four letters in the English language, and yet it does so much. It goes beyond any boundary that we could ever hope to believe is worth more than this. The second uh, set of verses comes from, you know, the controversial book of Song of Songs, but it happens to be one of my favorite sets of verses. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy as unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. We have already been given everything we need to confront this. Let's go out and do it. 
To begin with, I would like to share the definition of what an advocate is. An advocate is a leader who is to support and come alongside others. It is one who is for something and for others. You see, Martin Luther was a leader who had spoken hope into the hopeless. He had spoke hope into the times of where it may have seemed hopeless for people. Martin Luther Jean King Jr., sorry. <laughs> he, <laughs> he sacrificed himself to create a change that needed to happen. He sacrificed the ways that he was feeling, the ways that people were perceiving him sometimes. He sacrificed. But yet the most profound, perfect, and sacrificial leader was Jesus. He was an advocate for his people. Jesus came and he died and he chose to die for us because he loves us so much. You see, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 40, it says his flesh was weak, but his spirit was willing. He chose to die for us. When he was pouring out blood, sweating blood, he chose to die for us because he said, hey, I see you and I love you and I'm dying for you. And Martin, when he quoted from um, scripture in Galatians 3.38 in his I Have a Dream speech, he said, there is neither Jews nor Gentiles, for we are one in Christ Jesus. Martin was an advocate for all men and women of all ages, of all races, to come together and be unified. Because this is what the kingdom of God looks like. We are, a pe we are all people loved by the Lord and God is with all of us. So I've actually given two major key points. There's many other ways that we can go about being advocates for people, but I've given two. One, the first one is listening. Let's really engage with other people and listen to the stories of other people, where they're coming from, where they came from. Not just friends, yes, let's just, closest friends are so important in family, but people who you may never thought you would associate with. Let's listen to their story. Let's come alongside them and be an advocate for them. Let's, and the second one goes into the first one as well. It's being authentic. It's not easy and it takes time and it's a process, but we have to learn to be authentic with one another because I can't be, uh, like I cannot know, if I'm not knowing or understanding the ways that which you have walked through, where you walked through, I can't be an advocate for you. And we should be advocates for one another. Martin looked to Jesus and how Jesus was living his life when he was in his ministry. Martin was looking to the kingdom. He was looking at Jesus' example in the way that Jesus was being an advocate for people. So Trinity, we can have the many opportunities to be advocate for one another. And, and this can start here, but it also can go out to where we may go after college or even in the here and now in the outside of Trinity. Martin was a leader who sought the kingdom to create unity because he knew that this is what the kingdom of God looked like. Let's be advocates for one another. Hi, guys. Um, so I want to just take two seconds to talk about justice uh, and injustice. So first, I just want to uh, tell a little story. Um, so I have two nieces. One is three and one is five. They're my best friends. Um, and... My five-year-old niece right now is obsessed with superheroes. It's like her favorite thing to play. We play it for forever, okay? We have these capes we put on. It's really official. Um, and so uh, the other day, I was babysitting her, and we were playing superheroes and running throughout the house, saving everything. And um, finally, we reached the point where it was like time for lunch. I mean, I was hungry. She probably wanted to keep playing. But I, I told her, okay, Emma, time to take off the capes. Let's go inside and let's have some lunch. And she, and if you can picture this five-year-old little sash, she grabs the corners of her cape, she whips around and she looks at me and she says, injustice. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Where did you learn that word? Um, and so she starts listing off all these superheroes that she loves and these shows that she watches, uh, Justice League, Paw Patrol, DC Superhero Girls, I don't even know. Um, and... Uh, she started talking about how they're the ones who do justice. 
And so it was fascinating to me because these concepts of justice and injustice, they're everywhere, right? And like people, when they see wrong, no matter their background or what they believe or whatever, they have this desire to see wrong things made right. They have this desire for justice. Um, and in scripture, we find this uh, beautiful verse. It's one that you've heard before, I'm sure. It's in Micah 6, 8. And it says, He has shown you, O mortal one, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Um, I think oftentimes when we see heroes who act justly, it can make justice feel really, really far away. But there's this beautiful part here uh, in this verse that I think we sometimes overlook, and it's just the portion that says, He has shown you, O mortal one, what is good. Um, see that feeling of distress that you get when you see something that's wrong, the, the feeling of anxiety and frustration that you just want to make something right, uh, the confusion that happens in your head when we're trying to figure out, should I pick a side, where do I find my place in all of this? Um, oftentimes, that's God revealing something to you. It's God showing you uh, what should be in the midst of what isn't. Um, and that's how this verse, verse starts out. It says, he has shown you, O mortal one, what is good. He's revealed it to you. Uh, whether this be through racial divides, sex trafficking, abuse, or whatever it is that God has given you very specifically eyes to see, um, the act of doing justice was not just intended for people like MLK. The act of doing justice is meant for all people who call themselves Christ followers. Um, when I was in middle school, or maybe early high school, I don't remember, uh, I ran a small group of five-year-olds. I realize that this is the second story I'm telling about a five-year-old. I promise I have friends my age. Um, <laughs> but he was the cutest little, the most tender little boy. Uh, we'll call him E. And E was, uh, he would come to small group and he'd have a bunch of stories about uh, this little boy in Ghana whose family was sponsoring. Uh, and he would tell us about these letters he'd get. They were in the midst of trying to adopt him, uh, this boy from Ghana. And so he would call him his brother. So he'd come and be like, yeah, my brother wrote to me this week. And this is what he said. And this is what he's experiencing. And his parents would explain to him very tenderly uh, the way that this little boy in Ghana lived and the things that he was enduring there. Um, and so sometimes he would come and he would just be really sad for his brother in Ghana. Uh, and so uh, I remember one day he came very specifically and he said, do you know that the kids in the orphanage in Ghana, they don't have shoes? And it started to kind of click in his head the fact that I have shoes here and those people don't have shoes there. And that's not fair. Um, and I just watched him wrestle with this confusion as he, as he tried to understand it and as he wrestled with this grief that he felt for his brother in Ghana who didn't have shoes. Um, to the point where he felt so saddened by this that he went to his parents and he said, I have to do something. He's five years old, okay? It's crazy. Um, and his parents were so moved that they encouraged him to do what he felt he wanted to. And so uh, he started to raise money. So he went, um, he, he did little fundraisers, little five-year-old fundraisers. He sold lemonade. He went door to door asking for money um, in the bold way only a little kid would do. Uh, and uh, eventually they reached a goal, and he, they not only got shoes for the kids uh, in this orphanage, but E got the chance to go to Ghana and meet his brother and give him shoes. And when he got there, he brought this tub of water, and he washed the feet of the kids, and he gave them shoes. Um, and I'll never forget, I, I'll never forget watching this happen, because this whole process of this kid seeing this injustice he went through this process of grief, seeing it, this utter sadness, to the point where he couldn't, he couldn't just sit there. And by the time he was six years old, he had been to Ghana and had done something about this sad thing that he had seen. And so um, I, it just moves me because in this verse, it doesn't say to talk about justice. It doesn't say to post about justice. It doesn't say to see justice and let it bo injustice and let it bother you. Um, it says to act justly. And so uh, it, it's to let, allow the Holy Spirit to convict your heart, 
to let it break for the things that you see, and then to allow the Holy Spirit to move your hands to act. Thank you. Can I dream? When growing up, my third grade teacher asked me, what do you aspire to be? After taking it for the second time, I probably told her a football player, someone who makes money, or someone on TV. But that picture came before reality took away my picture frame and gave me broken glass that resented a chandelier that never made it off the store shelf. Truth of the matter was, life wasn't like family matters. Although we had many car winds, lows knocked down our door. d suspecting black suspects of selling narcotics, cops were very familiar with my duplex, as it was a faded brown with white chip paint that looked like desert camo in the nighttime. Yes, it was a war zone. We had a full house, but it wasn't quite like full house. I seen many people come and go to chase a high that never lasted longer than they hoped, addicted to dope. But can I dream? Truthfully, I didn't have time to dream or a vision of future me. There was a war for my soul. Vision died in my mind and blew up like landmines all around me. I was fighting a battle I never signed up or was ready for. So how can a young boy dream by living in a nightmare? And yes, it was similar to Elm Street. I seen many things on 5406 Carlton Street, Apartment B, Naples, Florida. It was where dreams died and hope wasn't alive. It was where neighborhood kids came to smoke weed and get high as we let our most influential years of our life pass us by. We, I, grew up too soon, never fell in love with cartoons. The chaos closed out all in the room. Us brothers fought like episodes of Dragon Ball Z. We were young, wild, and reckless and living free. But can I dream? My society told me to dream. It told me to reach for the stars. But on my journey, I never made it past the sun. And since he said eternity in my heart, the gravitational pull the grace sought me when I was in the dark. The light came and pursued me. He would change the direction of how I would run and gave me the gospel of peace. So now with a new perspective, I say this proudly. As I look at Dr. Martin Luther King's dream, I can only ponder what challenges he faced in the face of his dream as he spoke August 28th, 1963. Oh, what hardships I didn't allow him to see. Oh, the many things I wanted to suppress his dream. Despite our shortcomings and our hardships, we will all face ships like the Titanic, the Romans of the cold world that we are living in. Despite how you were raised, adversity will do one or two things. It will cause pain to create change. But what would define you? Because I refuse to let my barriers bury me based on believing bad behavior breaks benefits of brokenness that made me a better man. I said I refuse to let my barriers bury me based on believing bad behavior breaks benefits of brokenness that made me a better man based on the Father's plan. As our president, as our president addresses the state of the union, I am still at a standstill because still we are without unity. We are divided by four-letter words, love, hate, or race. Depending on how you see your well-being or state, love, L-O-V-E, we don't know how to or who to model it from. Hate, H-A-T-E, we hate those that hate us, which creates a cycle of unforgiveness that births self-hate and hate of others. Race, R-A-C-E, we rather focus on the color than the condition of the human heart where hate is rooted and is a cause of why we can't get along. So let's just call it what it is. There's still injustice in the world as in the days of old. But I am shouting out, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome. Dr. King, I'm still celebrating your dream in the face of calamity, injustice, and pain. As a boy, I was a fighter. As a man, I got a little smarter and started using my pen instead of my hands. No longer a bully because true love and hope gave me eyes to see. Jesus Christ, your blood is not in vain, for you are the hope of the world, and in you we will find change. President Obama said in his State of the Union speech some years ago, I believe in change because I believe in you, the American people. Well, I believe in change because I believe in God. So this poem is for those for fighting for love despite the hate, fighting for unity despite our differences, fighting for change despite our adversities. Can we dream? Can we dream? Can we dream? <laughs>